notorious conspiracy theory. By a conspiracy theory that... And according to the conspiracy theory... Far out conspiracy theories and... Obviously a lot of conspiracy theories. Conspiracy, conspiracy theorists are... People who believe in the QAnon conspiracy theory. so broad and often bizarre. It's also shockingly widespread. It's like an alternative reality game. Conspiracy theory... There's of online conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories. How a conspiracy theory... ...in conspiracy theories for... A ridiculous uh, conspiracy theory. Conspiracy theory, the term for an observation, report, or perspective that powerful forces controlling political institutions, which, importantly, include the news media, disapprove of and thus seek to obscure and ultimately defeat, often by attacking the given messenger. Contemporary use of the term was codified in CIA Dispatch 1035-960, issued on April 1, 1967, as a strategy to discredit independent and scholarly research into the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, in which the CIA was often implicated. Yet the contemporary mass media's disparagement of conspiracy-oriented researchers dates back over two centuries, specifically to several researchers interrogating the causes of the French Revolution. We consider the notable figures who were among the first modern thinkers denigrated by the mass media of their time as conspiracy theorists, those who dared to probe the satanic forces behind the brutally violent, fanatical, and proto-communist revolution in France, on this episode of The Memory Hole Blog Report. This is MHB Report. I'm James Tracy. On the eve of the French Revolution in 1789, the French journalist Jean-Pierre Louis de Luchet wrote, Learn that there exists a conspiracy in favor of despotism against liberty, of incapacity against talent, of vice against virtue, of ignorance against enlightenment. This society aims at governing the world, its object is universal domination. No such calamity has ever yet afflicted the world. A Deluche might be regarded as the first modern conspiracy theorist. In his published work, Essay on the Cult of the Illuminated, he argued that the leaders of the Bavarian Illuminati, led by a young university professor named Adam Weishaupt, had taken over Freemasonry on the continent and it was thus from the European Masonic Lodges that this mass rebellion was directed. The writer warned that the French Revolution might very well be the first of many calamities over the course of history. He was among several subsequent authors who took issue with the then popular propaganda and public sentiment that the revolution in France was a spontaneous uprising against the crown. And de Luchet was the first of several authors who argued that there was a specific design to the chaotic and violent coup, and that it was, at its core, diabolical. Along these lines, yet with a more sober air, the revered British statesman Edmund Burke condemned the French Revolution. His stance took many by surprise because he was a supporter of the colonial fighters in America. In his pamphlet, Reflections on the Revolution in France, Burke wrote, Already there appears a poverty of conception, a coarseness and vulgarity in all the proceedings of the new French assembly and of all their instructors. Their liberty is not liberal. Their science is presumptuous ignorance. Their humanity is savage and brutal. Burke's rebuke of the French Revolution was especially disturbing to the apparently hidden forces that controlled the mass media of the 1790s, precisely because of the transcendent respect he wielded in so many social and political circles. Moreover, Burke's stance clashed with the then-prevalent liberal progressive left line of the day, that the French Revolution was of the people and would thus help the common man. 
After Burke published Reflections, the flattery and adulation afforded him in the press and public debate almost immediately turned to vitriolic attack and defamation. Almost overnight, his strong criticism of the revolution made him a political pariah. When Burke died in 1797, he implored his family to bury him in a secret location because he feared that if the French revolutionaries or their allies prevailed in England, his body would likely be exhumed and desecrated. Three less salient figures similarly arose at this time to contend that the revolution in France was the first manifestation of a conspiracy. As British author and war correspondent Douglas Reed observes in his important book, The Controversy of Zion, written in the mid-1950s, these three men were the Jesuit priest and historian of French radicalism, Augustin Barul, Scottish scientist and professor John Robeson, and Reverend Jedediah Morris, a Yale University trained clergyman, geographer, and father of telegraphy pioneer Samuel Morris. In the 1790s, Barul published a four volume history of the French political activist group, the Jacobins, who were overtly behind the revolution. Professor Robeson likewise authored a book addressing the spiritual and ideological bearings of the revolution, and Reverend Morris published many of his sermons where he addressed the French Revolution. All of these works gained a high degree of notoriety, with numerous editions of each being published in Britain as well as the United States. These three men, all of vastly different backgrounds, reached the same conclusion. Barul saw the French Revolution as an anti-Christian conspiracy, not only against kings, but against every government, against all civil society, even against all property whatsoever. Professor Robeson argued that an association has been formed for the express purpose of rooting out all the religious establishments and overturning all existing governments of Europe. According to Reverend Morse, the express aim of the forces behind the French Revolution is to root out and abolish Christianity and overthrow all civil governments. In this way, all three assessments are fundamentally correct. The revolutionaries outlawed Christianity by murdering and terrorizing Catholic clergy, and they dethroned and beheaded the Christian king, Louis XVI. Christians were in turn forced to give unquestioning allegiance to the revolution and worship the new state by substituting secularism for their inherited Christian spirituality. This allowed for a number of previously forbidden practices to become eventually institutionalized, including usury and general licentiousness. As noted Catholic journalist and historian E. Michael Jones observes, Barul provided an abundance of evidence to prove his case, including theretofore unknown secret Masonic rituals. Yet he mistakenly theorized how the newly formed Bavarian Illuminati, led by Weishaupt, had, in just a decade, taken over continental Masonic lodges and were directing the French insurrection from within. British lodges, which Barul was a part of and held in high esteem, were, in his view, exempt from this infiltration. The reality is far more complex, as it involves in part the then prevalent Judaic Talmudic influence on Masonry, specifically its hatred of Christ and his discipleship and its patent rejection of the fundamental principles that define Christianity, the faith, hope, charity, and humility. The distinction between these precepts and their satanic inversion are readily apparent in the wanton bloodlust of the French Revolution, which serves as a clear prototype of most every subsequent communist revolution over the past two centuries. 
Despite the general accuracy of a secret cabal directing the French Revolution, each of these authors were viciously attacked by newspapers in both England and America, suggesting that even then, when addressing such sensitive topics as conspiracy, the press spoke with one uniform voice of rejection and condemnation. As Reed puts it, soon after the authors took an anti-revolutionary line and gained the public eye, the attacks began. They were nearly always anonymous. They made use of exactly the same language of doublespeak as that which is employed today. Barul, Robeson, and Morse were accused of starting a witch hunt, of being bigots and alarmists, of persecuting freedom of opinion and academic freedom, of misrepresenting liberal and progressive thought, and so on. As Reed notes, much as in today's press, the attacks extended to the author's personal lives, which were said to be immoral, and their financial habits suspect. At last comes the familiar suggestion that the authors were insane, a similar slander not ironically waged by the Pharisees 1,800 years prior against Jesus the Nazarene, their rejected Messiah, which were among the tactics they used to mobilize the first century equivalent of crisis actors and rent-a-mobs that helped to secure Christ's torture and ultimately his execution. On both sides of the Atlantic, the forces behind the defamatory campaign appeared to have been so fearful of the French Revolution conspiracy research taking hold of the public mind that the attacks continued long after Barul, Robeson, and Morse had passed on. As a result, their warnings were largely forgotten, and thus subsequent communist revolutions have never been placed in the proper historical context of the blatantly anti-Christian and anti-traditionalist revolutionary activities of 1789. So the conspiracy theorist defamation and obfuscation tactic is almost as old as the United States itself, the land where freedom of religion and political speech are formally protected. In most every instance, this propaganda is cynically deployed with the understanding that the average person is too dumb to draw their own conclusions. It is, in other words, consciously mobilized to take advantage of perceived public ignorance and direct hostility toward the message bearer and away from the given information or issue at hand. And with the aid of historical hindsight, we may conclude that where there's conspiratorial smoke being blown in the public's face, it is often misdirection to drive curiosity away from a smoldering or full-blown fire of scandal or corruption. If you like what we're doing in these videos, please consider becoming a patron of MHP at Patreon slash Memory Hole. For Memory Hole Blog Report and MemoryHoleBlog.org, this is James Tracy.